So welcome everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. This is Ask the Expert with Dr. Audrey Holland, who will be chatting with us about support, the power of positive thinking, and creating authentic happiness. I'm going to be your host. My name is Jen. I'm part of the team at the National Aphasia Association, a nonprofit organization dedicated to advocating for people with aphasia and their families. Maybe can you give us some updates on what's going on with you and what are some things that you find important? Wow, <laughs> that's, that's sort of a, well, I got to think about this for a minute. Okay. Um, I am uh, still very concerned and involved and caring and interested in the world of aphasia. I mean, that's kind of the most, one of the most obvious things about me, I think. And um, I, I'm happily living in a place where I'm totally free to do whatever I want to do. I mean, I'm not in any kind of uh, in long-term care or anything. So, you know, I drive my car and I take my cats to the vets and I live a normal life. Uh, but uh, I really miss being more active in the field of aphasia because that's kind of where my heart is. Can you talk a little bit about hope? Um, maybe even how it relates to the current situation we're in with the pandemic? Well, you know, I think hope is possibly the major ingredient in making the best of life after stroke and life after aphasia. And I have a feeling, that that's just the one I'm most familiar with, but I have a feeling that's true of a ton of other disorders that I not, do not know nearly so much about. So I think that hope and looking at the bright side of things and looking positively at life after aphasia particularly, but in generally, whatever life has handed you is a wonderful thing to see. And I'm in a position to see that sort of thing all the, all the time. Nowadays, we hear so much about life participation approach, but from what I understand, this approach was sort of everything you were about even before that term was developed. Oh, yeah. So maybe can we talk about um, what speech therapy was historically and what it's becoming, and then also give insight into approaching speech therapy from a wellness perspective? Well, you know, I think that my philosophy has always been I mean, after the first three or four people that I did not cure from aphasia, uh, that was pretty hard to take. But once, once that was over, then I, I thought I, I, be, I think I became a pretty rational realist about, okay, how do we fit this problem in? How do we help people get along in the world that they're maybe you're going to have to do this a little different. And that's sort of always been way, way back there, one of my big motivations. So maybe it isn't quite the same, but let's see what we can do to make it as close to the feeling of same as, as it was before. What are some things that a person can do to develop a stronger relationship? I think one of the most important things to ask people with aphasia as an aphasia therapist, what do you want out of this experience? And if you want to learn the grammar of the language, then maybe I'm not the person that you should be seeing because that's not my strength. My sense is that the worst situation is somebody with aphasia who doesn't have a support group. And part of that responsibility is not just 
for helping the person with aphasia, but it's also learning to understand the limitations and the, the strengths and uh, what is not, in my belief, a changed person. It's just a person with different kinds of strengths. Let's shift over to caregiver and family care. Um, can you give us some insight into caregiver care? In my experience, the more involved I have been with the families and they have been involved in the recovery, the more likely the outcome is to be positive. My best of all possible worlds, we don't work just with the person with aphasia, nor do we work just with family members in most cases. And so to me, it's kind of a dyadic relationship or uh, even more. I mean, what if, what if kids are really, really there to be helpful? I mean, then they have to be taken just as seriously as, it, as the persons with aphasia so, and spouses. So, you know, to me, it's get them involved, get them all involved if you possibly can. What suggestions do you have for a person with aphasia to stop other people from finishing their sentences? Um, and do you have any tips on how to deal with the frustration that when that happens? I think the thing that you do is one of, as a therapist, one of the things I would like to make people comfortable in doing is saying, I'll take care of this, wait. I'm capable of this. So that getting people to say that in whatever way is, I think part of the, part of the most important part, teaching people that, no, okay, step up for yourself. Oh, this is so wonderful. So James B shared with us that, uh, well, first he says, it's so great to see you guys. And I'm a survivor with aphasia that's going back to a private university to become a speech language pathologist. Oh, wonderful. That sounds so great. Congratulations. Yes. Wasn't it? That's so, that's so exciting. Um, Karen, K Karen C has said, thank you so much for sharing your updates with us. Have you been able to share with your residential setting some ways to make it more aphasia friendly for other residents? Well, in the institution, in the institution, oh God, they killed me, they'll throw me out. <laughs> the place where my apartment is, uh, I can't find anybody with aphasia. Now, the major problem that people have here that relates to my area of expertise and your area of expertise and all of our areas is hearing, hearing. And the major thing that needs to be done, I believe, is to increase the presence of people who are interested in working with hearing as well as speech. And that's kind of, I'm going to have a talk tomorrow with the director of the institution and say, I, I, I love the museum institution, but uh, the bottom line is that I'm gonna have a talk with him about, okay, here's some stuff we can do about hearing because hearing is, Suddenly I realize in a place like this that has you know, regular old, older people don't have any serious problems except communication problems with hearing, then that needs to be a focus. And I think I'm it. <laughs> You're always advocating. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm always trying to learn something new, so I don't mind that. 
um, Martina and Henry B. Professor Holland, if aphasia cannot be cured, what can an individual with aphasia do by themselves to improve as much as possible? Thank you. I would say that the first thing is to figure out what this person's strengths are and which are within his interests. So starting with things that are likely to change or get a little better and that are interesting to begin with to the person with aphasia, those are the kinds of things to, to start to work with or hearing problems even everything. We received some wonderful questions specifically about primary progressive aphasia. Um, so before we get into those, can you first talk about what primary progressive aphasia is? And I'm not the expert in this. Uh, somebody like Becky Kion, and I, I, there are many people I should have singled her out particularly. But primary progressive aphasia is different from stroke engendered aphasia in that it is likely to be part of a more general cognitive issue that's facing people as they uh, experience trouble reading and writing. It's seldom, it's seldom uh, simply uh, a language problem, but it usually brings with it a myriad of other uh, relate, related problems. So uh, it's, I, I think it's fabulous to work with people with primary progressive aphasia because the deal is that instead of trying to help people get necessarily better, what you're gonna be doing is trying to help them toe the line to not get any worse. And that's kind of different motivation for us, I think. And I think we go about that kind of from a different perspective, but I think it's important that the perspective be realized that this is not a condition that's going to necessarily improve, except to the degree that you can help someone adjust to it and live with it. One frequently asked questions that we get is about denial. Um, so what advice do you have for a communication partner of someone who doesn't believe they need to work on their speech <clears throat> or denies that there's even a speech break, a, a breakdown in communication? This is kind of iconoclastic, but I thinking until someone recognizes that they have a problem, that it's kind of silly to think that you're gonna do anything to help them get better. Uh, you can't say, hey, you, in case you don't know it, you have this problem. I just don't think that's the way to go. So my thought is, Keep people like that talking. Don't pathologize, which is to, you know, what I mean by that is not turn it into a system, uh, uh, as a, a symptom, but rather to say, okay, is there anything I can do to help? Perhaps it's getting hearing aid, perhaps it's new, 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 whatever. But to work within the reality that someone is willing to accept. 